Ivermectin is an antiparasitic drug that has been recently touted as a potential repurposed treatment for COVID-19. Over the next few minutes, we'll look at ivermectin's biochemical mechanism of action for parasitic infections, the studies that suggest efficacy against SARS-CoV-2, and the theoretic mechanism of action against the virus itself. To begin, a brief history. Related to the avermectin family of compounds first discovered in 1970, the name actually indicates its function. Latin A means without, and vermis means worms. Occurring naturally from a strain of Streptomyces bacteria, subsequently named Streptomyces avermites, the isolated compound secreted by the bacterium was found to clear worms from infected mice. Synthesized and modified forms of avermectin were developed to improve pharmaceutical properties with an 80-20% combination of two of these synthesized compounds generically named ivermectin and introduced in 1981. Ivermectin's mechanism of action for parasitic infections is interference of nerve and muscle function in worms and insects through hyperpolarization of the nerve cell membrane, resulting in fatal paralysis and parasitic death. To understand all of this, let's first look at how the electrochemical signal is transmitted through a normal nerve cell and how that signal is propagated to other cells along the neuronal chain. The nerve consists of a cell body with short dendrites providing electrical input to the cell body. The dominant, long projection off the cell body is called the axon, which is covered segmentally in a protein and phospholipid insulator called the myelin sheath. The nerve impulse propagates down the axon, treating the myelin sheath segments as a functional conductive unit. Therefore, the electric signal jumps between and is amplified in the unmyelinated segments of the axon called the nodes of Ranvier. At the axon tips, the signal is propagated to the next cell down the line through a synapse. The electric impulse causes small vesicles in the axon tips to degranulate or open up, releasing chemical neurotransmitters in the synapse, which subsequently bind to receptors on the dendrite of the next cell. There are many different neurotransmitters with various inhibitory and excitatory functions, but for the purposes of our ivermectin discussion, we will focus on glutamate. Glutamate is predominantly an excitatory transmitter found abundantly in the central nervous system of humans. When the glutamate binds to the postsynaptic receptor of the dendrite, it causes the cell to depolarize, propagating the electric impulse to the next neuron. Now let's look at the details of neuronal impulse generation at the nodes of Ranvier and the postsynaptic dendrites. In a resting nerve cell, the bilipid membrane of the cell body and axon maintains an osmotic gradient of sodium and potassium ions with a high concentration of potassium ions inside the cell and a higher concentration of sodium ions outside the cell. Both ions are positively charged. However, since the concentration of positively charged sodium ions is greater than the concentration of the positively charged potassium ions inside the cell, there is a net gradient across the membrane measuring minus 70 millivolts inside the cell at rest. Now let's zoom in on a single node and see how these ionic gradients are used to actually propagate the electric signal down the axon. Multiple transmembrane structures populate the node including sodium channels, potassium channels, and the sodium-potassium pumps. An electric signal propagating down the axon through the previous myelin sheath causes sodium channels in the axon cell membrane in the region of the nodes of Ranvier to open up, which, because of the resting concentration gradient, causes sodium ions to flow into the axon, increasing the number of positive charges and reducing the electric gradient down to zero. This is called depolarization. Depolarization causes more sodium ions to rapidly flow into the cell, reversing the gradient to approximately plus 40 millivolts, which triggers an action potential and propagates the nerve signal through the next segment of myelin sheath down to the subsequent node of Ranvier where the process begins again. To immediately stop the propagation of the electric signal, the now positive gradient closes the sodium channels and causes the potassium channels to open, allowing the outflow of potassium ions. Again, since the concentration of potassium is higher inside the cell than out, this outward flow of potassium ions is passive in the direction of the gradient. However, since we have positive ions leaving the cell, the membrane potential reduces down to zero and stops the action potential in the nerve. 
As the gradient reduces to zero, the potassium channels close and the ion flow is halted. To return the membrane potential to its baseline minus 70 millivolts, energy is required to push the sodium and potassium ions against their respective gradients. This is accomplished with the transmembrane sodium potassium pump. Utilizing the energy storing molecule ATP, the sodium potassium pumps move the ions against their respective gradients. With each pumping cycle, three sodium ions are moved out of the cell and two potassium ions move into the cell. With this asymmetric ion movement, the baseline minus 70 millivolt membrane potential is restored and the cell is now ready to fire again. Now let's briefly go back and look at the synapse and review some of the details of how a signal is passed from nerve cell to nerve cell. As we stated earlier, at the axon terminal, the action potential disrupts small vesicles which burst and release neurotransmitter chemicals into the synapse, in this case glutamate, the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system of humans. Just like on the axon, there are ion channels on the postsynaptic dendrite that allow the transmembrane flow of sodium, potassium, calcium, and sometimes chloride ions, but Unlike the axon, these channels respond to ligand binding rather than membrane depolarization. Glutamate binding to the channel receptors causes the channel to open and allow sodium ions to enter the cell and depolarize the membrane. If enough sodium enters the cell, an action potential is induced and the signal is propagated down the line. Since the glutamate receptors allow the flow of ions across the cell membrane, this type of channel is called ionotropic. In parasites and helminths, glutamate is actually an inhibitory neurotransmitter acting on glutamate-gated chloride channels, abbreviated GLU-CL. This transmural ionotropic channel consists of five subunits, each with a glutamate ligand receptor. When activated, a conformational change in the subunits opens up the channel and allows an influx of negatively charged chloride ions, which causes hyperpolarization of the nerve cell membrane and therefore makes it difficult to depolarize and propagate a nerve impulse. These channels seem to serve multiple roles in helminths, facilitating locomotion, feeding, and mediating sensory inputs into behavior. Ivermectin insinuates itself between subunits of the chloride channel, preventing it from closing, allowing free flow of chloride ions into the nerve cell, and maintaining hyperpolarization of the nerve cell membrane, thereby preventing nerve signal propagation. The accompanying paralysis results in parasitic death. Now that we've spent a solid seven minutes reviewing the electrochemical process of nerve cell propagation and ivermectin's effect on the glutamate-gated chloride channels, I know you'll be disappointed when I inform you that all of this has absolutely nothing to do with the proposed mechanism of action on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. As you can see, there are no nerves or ligand-gated ionotropic channels on the coronavirus that could possibly be affected by ivermectin or its derivatives. In fact, the virus is probably not much bigger than the channel itself. To understand ivermectin's possible role as a therapeutic agent for COVID-19, let's briefly review the process of viral host infection and replication. Mediated through the surface spike proteins, the virus accesses the host cell through either membrane fusion or endocytosis. The endocyte fuses with cytoplasmic lysosomes and the lysosomal proteases break down the surface proteins and expose the viral genome for replication by the host ribosomes. In the process, some of the viral antigenic proteins are released into the cytoplasm. These can be degraded and ingested by the host cell or, based on in vitro studies, can be picked up by important alpha and important beta-1 nuclear transport proteins. These nuclear transport proteins then guide the viral proteins through nuclear pore complexes or anatomic channels of the nuclear membrane. Theoretically, these imported protein complexes somehow induce the production of cytokines and chemokines which suppress the local immune response, allowing the virus to replicate unchecked. There are at least two theoretic mechanisms of action of ivermectin on SARS-CoV-2 infection. In 2020, Stephen Lair and Peter Reinstein utilized a computer docking model and were able to demonstrate a possible chemical domain that could be bridged by ivermectin between the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and the adjacent ACE2 surface protein of the host. 
This bridging may result in conformational changes in the spike glycoprotein that could interfere with viral access to the host cell and thus prevent viral replication. The authors published their results in the journal In Vivo in October 2020. In May of 2020, Yang et al. published an article in the journal Antiviral Research demonstrating ivermectin's possible ability to inhibit the important alpha-beta-1 nuclear transport molecule and thus prevent nuclear transport of viral proteins into the host nucleus, eliminating immune suppression and allowing a full immunologic host response. Both studies above are in vitro or outside-the-body examination of ivermectin and SARS-CoV-2, and some critics believe have limited relevance to clinical efficacy as the required doses to obtain adequate local concentrations of the drug are prohibitive as a possible therapy in humans. Some studies suggest that ivermectin may simply be a powerful anti-inflammatory which may account for the observed clinical response. To date, most of the clinical claims of efficacy, while impressively dramatic, are anecdotal or observational, and we know that correlation does not prove causation. A number of double-blinded clinical trials are underway evaluating the efficacy of ivermectin against SARS-CoV-2. One of these studies by Ahmed et al. out of Bangladesh, published in the International Journal of Infectious Disease earlier this month, found that a five-day course of ivermectin administered early in the course of clinically symptomatic COVID-19 patients may reduce the duration of illness. As more studies report their findings, we should have a clearer picture in the next few months of the role of ivermectin, if any, as a potential therapy for SARS-CoV-2. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.